Everyone, <clears throat> thank you again for joining us for our COVID-19 lecture series here at Elizabethtown College. I'm Jesse Waters, director of the Bowers Writers House here at Elizabethtown College. And if you've been joining us for these lecture series, you know that they've just been outstanding, informative, passionate, sophisticated. But I have to tell you, I'm really looking forward to today's presentation because I don't think I can watch the final episode of Ozark again. I've just absolutely worn it thin, and I'm really looking for some different ways that I can engage, and to also find some ways that other people in our communities are doing the same. So, without further ado, let me introduce our guest for today with his presentation, Staying Out of the Deep End. Our presenter today is Joel Janiszewski, who's the Director of Purposeful Life Pathways and Civic Participation Center for Community and Civic Engagement. Joel directs the Center for Community and Civic Engagement, which coordinates a broad range of service and engagement programs in partnership with community benefit organizations from throughout the area, including service projects and trips and community-based learning courses. Prior to coming to us here at Elizabethtown College, he worked with grassroots community organizations in Illinois and in education startups in Connecticut. And just as a reminder, you can always submit a question through our Q&A section here on your Zoom file, and we'll have a collected question and answer session at the end. So Joel, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Jesse, thank you for the for the kind introduction. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to, to be with you all uh, today. I'm glad that the sun is shining and spring is, spring is here. Um, as Jesse had mentioned that this is the third presentation in our Elizabethtown College speaker series on COVID-19. Um, I wanna extend a thank you to my colleagues who preceded me uh, in, in the previous weeks, uh, Dr. Fletcher McClellan, who presented on the politics of contagion a couple weeks ago, and Dr. David Kenley and Dr. Jeff Bach, who made a, a really interesting presentation last week about China, um, the United States, and how members of the Church of the Brethren traveled to China um, about 100 years ago to give aid to people in the middle of a disease outbreak that is very much like what we're dealing with right now. I'd encourage you to go back and, and look at those recorded presentations if you uh, haven't had a chance to see them yet. Um, Today, I'm, I'm joining you from, my, from our home office, um, just like uh, everybody, we're, we're um, in, the, in, in our homes, um, in, in the midst of our communities who are doing quite different things in the face of the, the, the current pandemic. Uh, our, our home office right now has been, has been getting lots of use in different ways. Um, we have elementary age, uh, elementary age children, and so we're working on doing online schooling, uh, doing our regular work here, and, and keeping everything going in this really uh, rather unprecedented kind of uh, situation that, that we find ourselves in. Um, I hope that, that you're doing all right, um, that there are lots of new kinds of challenges that, that we've all been grappling with, uh, and one, one, one of the things that, that we wanted to do with the creation of the speaker series was to, was to share information about, about you know, areas of expertise that Elizabethtown, you know, that folks at Elizabethtown College have, and, and, to, you know, and, and to provide um, you know, community outreach and, and a place for, for you know, to, to give you time to use your imagination and, and think about what's, you know, what's happened and what's possible. Um, that the, the goal of, of, the, of the presentation today um, is is to is to first you know talk about you know what is community engagement what does that mean to to, pre to present some examples and ideas of what what people near us and far away from us are doing right now in the in the face of the you know our, our global health crisis what are the things that people are doing to to help others and to build communities. Um, that there are some really interesting and important developments that, that are unfolding day by day. And I wanna share some of those with you. Um, and one of the things that I've learned as I've been compiling information and being in contact with, with partners in different parts of the community is that social distancing is not stopping community engagement and community involvement. And so that's, that's, an, that's an exciting thing. And then later on in the presentation that I'll, I'll talk about what we can do um, that will be that'll focus on some concrete examples you know share what's going on but then also look at ways that that we can move ahead uh, and then as Jesse had had mentioned that we can uh, there'll be time for for response 
to questions that, that you may have that come up. So please use the Q&A uh, feature to, to provide your questions and then we can provide some answers. And so this is a view from the diving board at, at our local pool in our community. Um, and in our community, the pool is a really important community gathering place um, that in the summer we'll go to the pool and intersect with with neighbors with with families with friends if, you know place to hang out and share information and that's that's one of the places in our community where where, where people gather together you know in in un, in real informal ways but ways that that strengthen the ties that that really bring us together um, this, this is clearly a picture from, from the end of the diving board. At the deep end of the pool, I have younger children, and so that we don't spend a lot of time at the deep end of the pool yet. Uh, it's, it's a pretty unfamiliar place for us that it takes a little bit of a courage to, to, you know, to muster up the, you know, the gumption to swim out to the deep end and hang out by the diving board. I keep nudging the kids to do that, but it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a stretch for us. And this is an image that that came to mind because you know that the places where our communities are right now that we're in a place of you know of, of uncertainty and what's what what will tomorrow look like what will next week look like you know and so like it's it's this place of you know of uncertainty and so that you know it's it's some uncharted territory kind of like the deep end of the pool for my family you know over over time. You know, my, my kids have been building more confidence as they swim further and further out. And I think that as our communities learn to function and adapt in new ways in the midst of the crisis, that we'll be able to swim out into that deep end a little bit more too. And so we've been dealing with the impacts and effects of social distancing for a number of weeks now. And this is a picture of downtown Lancaster just a few weeks ago. And it's really clear that there is, is just not much going on, that lots of our community squares are pretty empty right now. Um, I've been captivated by some of these kind of haunting images that have come up in different news sources from around the world, from bustling places that are no longer bustling, at least for the time being, you know, and so, as, as, we're, as we're following our social distancing guidelines that come from the Centers for Disease Control and, and other public health experts, you know, we're doing things like avoiding close contact. We're avoiding close contact with people who are sick. We're being encouraged to stay at home as much as possible and to only go out very sporadically. Uh, you know, that we're putting distance between ourselves and other people. Um, and that we're, we're doing these things in order to, to keep high risk people in our populations and in our communities safer and to reduce the amount of stresses and strains on our medical systems, which in, you know, in a pretty large number of places around the country are really stretched and maxed out right now. There's, there's a pretty wide body of research that's been developed over the years about the impacts of social isolation, which, which is one of the, which, which is really one of the effects that we're dealing with right now as we are in this time of intentional social distancing. You know, so that, that research shows that, um, that being isolated from others can have long-term medical effects that, that can, that a detriment similar to the impacts of obesity and smoking and high blood pressure. Um, and, and there are all kinds of studies um, that, 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 that point us in this direction. And so suddenly we're in a place where we're being told that we need to isolate in order to promote health of our broad community. And at the same time, our research also shows that the long-term effects of big time isolation are rather sizable too. Uh, and on the flip side, we find that social connection, you know, can strengthen, seems to strengthen your immune system, help, can help people to recover from disease faster and, leng and lengthen your lifespan. Um, and importantly, as we're wading through these uncertain times right now, um, you know, people who feel connected to others can have lower levels of anxiety and depression, higher levels of self-esteem, and also greater empathy toward others. And so, um, 
what what we really want to do is is to find ways to connect and new ways to connect in order to you know to to improve the health and lives of everyone around us and the things that we're learning over the course of this time i think will be instructive going forward in our community life and so i, I want to i want to take a a minute to 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 think about how we connect with our communities um and so we'll 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 start from this you know really simple place about you know start with you and we'll start with me right it's like starting with with me in my day-to-day -day life and i my day-to-day -day life is really shaped by the context of my family and the people that live in my household who i'm with every day um in you know in my community as we're you know working on um, schooling and work and keeping our household going and all those things and that's like our first set of relationships and then when we when we take a step further out or like a click out in into into our communities um that that our communities are made up of a you know a, a, a range of different kinds of organizations and this this is a really simple kind of arrangement and different a simple kind of categorization but but our our communities are made up of um, social service organizations, um, their schools are, are key organizations in our communities, religious organizations, businesses, volunteer organizations and voluntary association kinds of groups in government. And these, these, these are, you know, the, all the important players in, in, in certainly in the small town where, where we live. And we're all connected to, to these organizations. Um, you know, we're, we're connected to the schools. We have children in the schools. We pay, we pay property taxes and support the schools that, that families have connections to different religious organizations, you know, in their communities, um, that, that we're connected to local businesses when we go down to the local gas station and fill up on the way to work, or we make it to Friday evening and don't know what to have for dinner and go to the local pizza place. Um, that, you know, that these, these, these are things that, that, that are important part of our of our day to day life, that we're connected to volunteer organizations, um, community benefit groups, um, PTO, all kinds of different groups, and then we're you know we're we're connected to government and the role that that government plays in our community, you know, and then we're all you know and, and similarly many are connected to social service organizations um, that 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 provide important social supports, whether in the short term or long term. You know, and so every you know everybody is connected to these organizations in different ways, and what we're realizing uh, is help help me to realize certainly during this time you know is is that that these connections are important connections, and some of these connections are under strain right now. And then when we look at these organizations, we also realize that that all of these organizations are connected to each other. That there is a relationship between the government in the schools, um, that there is a relationship between social service organizations um, and the schools, right? And providing support for, for students and families in different ways. That there are connections between businesses and government, um, that there are certain roles and responsibilities that businesses have to perform uh, in the same way that the government is also responsible to us in the things that they do. Um, volunteer organizations and religious organizations work together maybe it's about putting together like a local community block party that happens once a year or you know like there's different kinds of coordination and relationship that exists and that the the a, a, an important fact to keep in mind is that these you know that we're a part of a network of organizations in our communities and that all of these connections matter and it's these connections that really form the bonds in our community and that these connections are are what are under stress and strain right now but then at the same time it is these connections that will be so vital as for us to to, to develop ways to to serve our neighbors in our communities and to build and rebuild moving forward as the time of the pandemic winds down and we develop new paths forward and so this is our little synopsis of community. And so when, when, when we're looking at what do we mean by community, that 
that the, the previous examples to help you to see that community is, is made up of connections. Um, uh, another definition of community that resonates with me right now is that a community is a group of people who are affiliated by their geographic proximity, uh, can be affiliated by special interests, similar situations, or shared values. You know, so it's these people in a certain place or people who are united by, by particular interests. And so like when we're talking about community, that's, that's what we're talking about. And that the, the real nuts and bolts of, of this presentation are, is, is about community engagement. And the things that, that I'll talk about going forward um, are, are, are um, collaborative efforts um, between and among people. You know, and so, we're, so that specifically for community engagement, we're talking about collaboration for the mutually beneficial exchange of knowledge and resources in the context of partnership and reciprocity. So it's kind of the, like those partnership and reciprocity, like those things are represented in that previous diagram with all those lines that connect people. That community engagement can involve partnerships and coalitions that help mobilize resources and influence systems. Um, and, and at the same time, that, that, that this mobilization can become a catalyst for initiating um, new policies, um, modifying current policies, programs, and practices. So it's all about people working together in order to share resources to address key issues in the community. And so when we're talking about community engagement, that's, that's really what it's about. And so, yeah, so like the, like the, the examples that we'll provide um, will we'll be examples of, of people working together in the face of unfamiliar, you know, the unfamiliar context that we find ourselves in right now. And I want to I wanna highlight five main paths to, to civic action in service as, as we're looking at the things that, that people are doing together to, to, to um, serve others in their communities and build new coalitions and projects and programs. And so the, the, the real focus is on, is on collective initiatives. Um, there, are, there are wonderful examples all over the place that, that I love seeing every day about individual projects that, that people are doing that are, that are benefiting neighbors and communities. And you know, those things that are super important that um, I know of people in my local community who are, who are doing individual projects to, to, help, you know, to help specific neighbors. They're making a mask for, for a shut in down the street. You know, it's, it's doing these real kinds of indiv like individual projects and those are really important things. Uh, and, the, 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 scale, the scope of this presentation is really about the things that, that groups are doing together um, in, in order to take care of common goods and empower citizens. And so the, the, the areas that, that, that I'll highlight um, in the next few minutes are on volunteer service and philanthropy, advocacy, organizing, and social entrepreneurship. And one way to think about these is that these are different kinds of approaches to addressing community needs and challenges. Um, that, you know, that, that, that as, as, as we're describing, like the nature of these kinds of approaches that you could, you know, could, could consider, uh, you know, like what, 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 are the, what, what are the positives for this particular approach? What are some of the negatives for, for these approaches? That, that, that they each can, can be deployed kind of as, as tools um, to, to help address community needs. So the first um, path to civic action and service is, is volunteer service. And we're surrounded by examples of volunteer service all the time. And volunteer service is all about meeting someone's needs immediately and directly through volunteer efforts. You know, so you're not paid for your work. Um, at, at, at one level, volunteer service is, is pretty simple and straightforward, but it's a very, but at the same time, it's a very broad area. Uh, you know, that, from raking leaves for a neighbor is, you know, is, is a simple example of volunteer service, but a sim like at the same time, serving in the Peace Corps for two years and in an international placement is also volunteer service. There's a broad range of possibilities in talking about volunteer service, but, but the key elements were that, that, that are at play are about providing time and experience 
and other kinds of resources to advance the work of a nonprofit or a community benefit organization in your area. And so that, that um, for the examples, I'm going to I'm going to provide a couple examples um, for you know for for each of these areas or civic paths. Um, and the examples I'm going to draw on are things that are directly tied to the response to the pandemic. And so one one key community player um, is the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank. Um, the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank is a nonprofit that works to reduce hunger in 27 Central Pennsylvania counties. Um, they, they work with more than a thousand local agencies and programs and that an early estimate was that they, they serve over 135,000 people in need every month. But we know given the, the, the rapid changes in the economy with, with people being laid off and losing work, that the, that the demand for the, the resources that the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank provides um, are, are under great strain already. Um, and that there are mobilization efforts happening that I'll tell you a little bit more about later in further detail about how we can benefit the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank to help feed people in our communities. Um, one really interesting uh, example of a volunteer service um, has comes from Harrisburg, where a local where a local pastor uh, established many food pantries to that are that are in the middle of neighborhoods so that people can come and get what they need when they need it um, that originally the, um, the 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 food pantries had been serving as mini lending libraries for people especially targeted toward kids in communities uh, and pastor james lyles had the idea of starting a few weeks ago to take those um, mini libraries and convert them into mini food pantries and he started with one and local businesses started started contacting him and saying we'd really like to participate in this too can we put a box near us can we help to support this and so he has a growing network of some of these small food pantry boxes where people can make contributions and people can come no questions asked and get things that they need to support their families um, i've i've heard recently um, in the last in the last week about a similar effort happening in southern Lancaster County too. And so these things are around us, but what's happening is that that people in the community are, are networking together in order to build scale and, and to build out the number of these boxes that are available to immediately provide assistance to families. Another local nonprofit group that has that has been created in just the last couple of weeks is called Lancaster Masks. Um, and Lancaster Masks is the result of, uh, of a collaboration among a diverse group of people in Lancaster. Um, most of them did not know each other prior to forming the group, and they united largely online in order to meet a key community need. So when, when, when people started hearing about the fact that local hospitals and caregivers um, were running out of protective face masks, uh, several prolific sewers formed online groups uh, inviting others to join and pool resources and advice so they could mass produce masks and distribute them as quickly as possible. Uh, and what, what they figured out very quickly is that if they were able to pull their resources together, that, that they, could, they could scale up their operation and, and, and provide bigger benefit to people in the community quicker. And so the organization Lancaster Masks was born. Um, that I'll have information about how to be in contact with them at the end of this presentation too. You know, and so these examples, like both like these examples around volunteer service are about people recognizing needs in a community and then pulling together in order to work together to, to boost the impact that, that they're having. And these are wonderful examples of volunteer service. Another key civic action path uh, is philanthropy. And philanthropy, you know, in, in a broad way, involves community members working together to leverage resources to address challenges and to improve the quality of life in a community. Many times this is done through through fundraising and in financial support. Um, that it's that in the end it's really about building assets and capacity for doing for doing work in a community and also building trust. Um, and that that there, there are some really interesting local examples um, of, of philanthropy in action. 
to serve the community. One is being um, spearheaded by the Lancaster County Community Foundation. And they, um, in partnership with the United Way of Lancaster County, um, are, are, are launching a new fund called Lancaster Cares. And that they are raising money for the Lancaster Cares Fund in order to support Lancaster residents who are facing challenges with food, with housing, and also pooling resources in order to provide rapid response dollars to respond to new and emerging issues. And so that the, the, the Lancaster County Community Foundation you know, is, is working to, to pull together resources in a real rapid response kind of way to get money out to, to improve food security, housing support, and also to be able to address emerging community needs. Similarly, the Foundation for Enhancing Communities, which is located in Harrisburg and is formerly known as the Greater Harrisburg Foundation, is doing a similar local fundraising push um, that, that their fundraising push is in partnership with the United Way of the Capital Region uh, for their COVID-19 Community Response Fund. And that they are raising funds in order to provide supports to nonprofits in the communities who are really in their community and in the surrounding area, who are really on the front lines of dealing with the, with, with, with the virus outbreak. Um, and I'll, I'll have more information at the end of the presentation about that. Beyond these, these local and regional philanthropic efforts and responses to the pandemic, that there's also large scale national response that's being marshaled by, by really large foundations. Uh, an, an important example of that is being spearheaded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the nation's largest health philanthropy. And that their, their overall organizational focus is on ensuring that everyone in the United States has a fair and just opportunity for health and well-being. And so what, what, they, what they are doing and, I, and have pledged to do is to provide $50 million in immediate short-term relief to um, national and community organizations to help families and communities that are under the greatest strain right now. Um, there's, there's particular funding relief going to efforts in, in the foundation's home state in New Jersey, but that their goal is to get large amounts of money out to people that need it the most in order to, to feed people, to support domestic workers and emergency response workers, and to, and to work to, to provide supports for families and communities that, that desperately need it at this time. The, the, the third um, civic action path uh, is, is advocacy. And advocacy in, in a real broad way is about, you, is, is, is about using persuasion and education in order to achieve a particular um, action or, or change in policy or program. Um, advocacy is a, is a long-term kind of solution where people are seeking change by securing and promoting solutions to community issues, um, shaping social and political outcomes, uh, systematically influencing decision making, and also educating um, decision makers and the public about, about, about the purpose for bringing about that change. Um, you know, persuasion is, is an important piece of the puzzle for advocacy, uh, in, along with relationship building and connection. Um, and like many of these um, um, civic action paths that, that nonprofit and community benefit organizations often function and, and utilize some of these paths at the same time. So that there are a number of um, nonprofit organizations that rely heavily on volunteer service to implement their program and work toward living out their mission. And at the same time are involved in advocacy efforts and philanthropy efforts to, in order to support their overall program. And so one, one, one interesting um, advocacy organization that, that is currently being built and has, you know, that has just been publicized in the last couple of weeks uh, is called Save Philly Restaurants. And I, you may have seen ads on television or on other kinds of restaurant and um, food service world um, work advocacy organizations that, that are being formed. Um, this, this is a more local one. And so that Save Philly Restaurants uh, has been started by restaurant owners to advocate for policies that benefit restaurant employees, uh, in, in particularly in and around the, the Philadelphia area. And so things that they're advocating for are emergency unemployment benefits for restaurant workers, 
um, rent abatements and a moratorium on, on evictions um, for restaurants and for restaurant workers. Uh, government intervention to require special insurance provisions for businesses that have been, that have been impacted and shut down. Um, emergency loans, you know, so like they're, they're advocating for things that will, that will benefit people that work in restaurants. And then as a result, um, the wider, the wider community, um, you know, in the end, the goal is, is around working to convince decision makers that they need to consider these important factors and work, and work for these policy changes. At, at the national level, um, the, the American Medical Association is a, a, a well-publicized advocacy organization that has been very busy for, for obvious reasons. Um, that, that the American Medical Association is, is really working to remove obstacles that physicians face uh, in, in their work to, to, to treat people afflicted, afflicted with the COVID-19 virus. Uh, things that the AMA has been working to do is, is to uh, make, make appeals to, to um, both national and state level governments for more supplies and personal protective equipment, to advocate for telehealth policies so people can, can get um, visits with the doctor from, from, the, from the comfort and security of their homes, um, working to, to, to negotiate with insurers um, about, uh, about payment issues, you know, so that, that, it's, that the AMA you know, is itself a, a powerful advocacy organization that's, that's working to, to deal with these, these frontline kinds of issues and, and to represent the voices of physicians and healthcare workers um, as, uh, to policy makers and decision makers. The fourth civic path is organizing. And organizing is, um, is an approach, is, 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 is an approach that, that brings people together um, based on shared interest and beliefs to address issues and to work collaboratively toward change in their communities. That the goal is to bring local, dis local people together in the community in order to build power to engage with decision makers, decision makers being uh, legislators, folks in the government, business owners, important people in the community, uh, in order to address issues that are directly affecting that community. That the goal is to work to change the system in, in a very local way. So um, an example of an organizing effort in, in our area is happening in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Tenants Union. Um, and some, some of their, org as they're building their organization, some of their, the, the demands that they're working to enact are about imposing a moratorium on rent while people lose their jobs during the crisis, um, ex extending a moratorium on evictions and utility shutoffs for people um, in, in and around Philadelphia. Um, imposing a moratorium on foreclosures for owners of apartment buildings. You know, as, every, as people aren't working and aren't earning money and aren't paying rent, there's a big cascading effect. And they are working to, to deal with some of these key issues to keep people in their homes. Um, there, there's, there are similar efforts going on all over the country. Um, in Los Angeles, the Liberty Hill Foundation is supporting a wide range of organizing groups. Um, that, that, that are dealing with those housing issues, but then are also working to, to secure paid leave for municipal and private sector employees um, when they're laid off from their jobs. That they're, they're working to, to release nonviolent offenders from jails that have become COVID-19 hotspots where transmission rates are, are accelerating um, very quickly. Um, that, you know, so that, so that, um, really people are coming together to deal with particular issues in their communities um, and, 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 and mobilizing very quickly um, in, in the face of the rapidly spreading virus, at least in some places in the country. The, the last civic path is social entrepreneurship. And social entrepreneurship is about, follow, about implementing business principles to meet social and envi or environmental needs through, through products and services and, and processes of different kinds. Um, social enterprises are businesses that focus on the people in the community, um, that they can be nonprofit or for-profit, 
but what they do is that they generate revenue in order to, to implement strategies to address cultural, economic, and environmental issues. Um, one really um, prominent and somewhat well-known social enterprise business is Newman Zone. Um, that is the, the, the food company that was started by the actor Paul Newman a number of years ago. And what Newman Zone does is that um, from, um, as a result of, of selling all of their food products like salad dressings and all that kind of stuff, that they take 100% of their after-tax profits um, and they give them to the, to the Newman's own foundation, which takes those funds and uses them to fund education and other charitable organizations. So they're using business in order to fund community benefit kinds of activities and operations. There, one, one interesting, um, one interesting uh, social entrepreneurship example um, comes from Vietnam, where um, an, an American social entrepreneur had an has an organization called the Asia India India, pardon me, the Asia Injury Prevention Foundation, and that organization was started in order to 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 make bicycle helmets for people in Asia in Asia in Vietnam in particular in order to to deal, to provide a, a solution to um, uh, lots of head injuries and things from bike accidents. And what they found, what he found recently was that with people being socially isolated and quarantined at home, that there wasn't a need for their factories to make bike helmets anymore. And it shifted their production uh, into making um, face masks for, for people uh, in, in the cities of Vietnam. So they're retooling their production uh, in order to directly address a local health issue, you know, and in the in the same way, Ford and General Motors are using productive capacity uh, to to build ventilators and other kinds of medical equipment that we desperately need. And I think that we could argue that that's that probably fits under social entrepreneurship, where they're using business practices, they're being paid for that work, but they're using their productive capacity to address a key social need that. That, that will benefit thousands and thousands of people. And so I'm gonna take a, a break here for a minute for some, for a couple of questions with Jesse. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic information and, and really categorized well so that we could see the division of all the ways in which community is being engaged and how we might participate. A few specific questions uh, and then maybe some things to sort of chew on and we can chat about. Um, one, first of all, for our, uh, for the Lancaster food banks and for those that are around here, can we put boxes in our own neighborhoods and collect large amounts of goods to be donated that way? Or is it really better off that we do this individually? Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll have a little bit more information coming, including contact information, but, but to make a long story short, that, that the most effective way to, to provide for, for food banks and food pantries in our area is, is, to, is to contribute to the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank and to make financial contributions. Because what, what the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank does is that they're able to buy and acquire food products at really large scale. So the kinds of prices that they can pay are fractions of, of what we would pay. And so if you're able to contribute $5 to them, they can stretch that $5 much further than we could. Um, and, and at the same time, that they're able to, to, to acquire things strategically. So that way they, they know among all the members in their network in the area, what are the particular needs in, in a given neighborhood food pantry. And so it makes for a much more efficient allocation of resources. And, and perhaps right along those same lines, is there a national organization that helps local and regional food banks um, kind of fall under a particular umbrella or a kind of coalescence? Is there a national organization that helps local and regional food banks do what they do? Yes. Yes, there is. And of course, the name of the organization, I'm blanking on it right now. I'm sure I'll think of it later. But, but basically, what, like, there, a, a system's been developed that, that, that brings together like, the big regional food banks, like the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank and food banks all over the country. And, 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 and they collaborate basically in, in a special kind of market where to, to bid on, on food products, to disseminate them around the country. And what they found is that makes for for a quite efficient way of making sure that, that areas that have 
a whole lot of one kind of food item, like you have a whole bunch of potatoes in Idaho, food pantries in Idaho don't need lots of potatoes, let's get them to Kansas where people really need them. And they found a way to do that, which, which is really interesting and important. Okay, and uh, w one other specific thing, in terms of the Lancaster Masks organization, can, can we send them masks? Can, it, Yes, so, so what, what they're looking for, and I'll have, I'll have contact information on, on the last slide to make sure that's up at the end for our Q&A, and I'll keep that up on the screen for sure. And that's a really great question. And they, they've, they have a simple website, and the things that, that there's a way you can contact them to offer your services if you want to, if you want to help to create masks, that's really great. Um, they're also looking for financial contributions. Um, I, I know that I'll probably make a financial contribution because my, my handicraft skills are pretty rudimentary <laughs> at best. But, but there are multiple ways of, 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 of being involved and we'll have that information right at the end. Okay, so, so one more question here, maybe something that this, this, is, this might be kind of a curveball. This is not an easy <laughs> question. Summer is going to be here before we know it. Um, let's say I'm a parent or a single parent uh, or uh, an individual with a partner and we have kids, how do I keep them from making themselves crazy or from making me crazy? What are, are, are there perhaps specific central Pennsylvania organizations that can help me understand how to diversify the activities for my family? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, that, that's a really important question, um, something we deal with here on a small scale every afternoon when the kids finish their schoolwork and we're trying to get our work done still. Um, but the, I know that local school districts have been putting out information. Um, the local public libraries uh, are, are really important resources. Uh, I, I know that the public library in Elizabethtown, uh, in Lancaster, and, and in Mount Joy, that, that, those, that they've been sharing resources online about, about different kinds of possibilities and opportunities um, that, you know, that, that this, this I, I think that, that that will also be like one of the next wave kinds of things to deal with is, is it looks likely that I may not be able to be at my community pool come June and about what we're gonna do. And so I, I'd look for some more of those things to be coming. Um, but I know that, yeah, some of those things are, are out there right now. Um, I, I do know that the Lancaster newspaper has, has been working with, you know, with the Lancaster County Community Foundation, United Way, Lancaster Masks, and some of these other organizations that I've highlighted today um, in, in, in order to, to kind of get to be a gathering place for, you know, for, for some of that vital community information about what to do and how to do it. And really, I think, I mean, at some level, we're, we're, we're creating things as we go and things that we know in June will be pretty different from what we know right now. Sure. Okay, um, great little intermission there. I think I'll turn it back over to you now uh, for the remainder of the presentation. Again, folks, two very quick reminders. You can always send questions through the Q&A uh, button on your uh, Zoom feature. And I just have to give a pitch for all of the wonderful summer camps that Elizabethtown College will be offering. You should be able to find that information on our website. And even if COVID-19 is still going on, we're working on ways to create models of those camps that will be electronic, uh, that will involve a sense of engagement. So do look into those because those will be some great experiences. Okay, Joel, back over to you. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, so we, we, we used, we used our, our, our beginning time, our lengthy introduction beginning time, really to, to kind of lay out the landscape of, of, of what organizations are doing and how they're doing it. Um, now I really want to focus on, in, over the next like 10 minutes or so, about like, what do we do? How do we do this? Um, and the first thing I want, I want to highlight are, are, are some insights that I've adapted from my colleagues, uh, Dr. David Kenley and Dr. Jeff Bach. Uh, last week, they, they, they presented a list of insights as they were talking about international engagement around stemming the spread of COVID-19 and some important factors that we need to keep in mind as, as, as we're working together, trying to work together and moving forward. And so, um, I thought that, you know, these insights are really important at the local level too, uh, you know, and so the first insight that's super important, move, you know, as, as we continue on is cooperation, you know, in the example of Lancaster masks, that, that there were new avenues available through cooperation, people connected online who really didn't know each other very well before, uh, in, in order to build an organization 
to you know to that 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 was really benefiting our community. Um, are are there places where where you might see new opportunities to cooperate with others um, down the street, online, uh, in your community, in in different ways? Um, I'd I'd encourage you to look for look for examples of cooperation that are happening and to have an open mind about new kinds of cooperation that that might benefit uh, our neighbors and our communities. Another key insight or factor is transparency and trust. Um, in, in the example about the creation of, of, the, of the food boxes in Harrisburg and then in Southern Lancaster County, you know, that they function on the honor system and that takes a lot of transparency and trust. I trust that I can go and get what I need. I trust that you're not gonna take more than what you need, you know, in that, in that sense that, that we're all really in this together. Um, uh, a, a related story that's, that's been in the news quite a bit, you know, is, is about toilet paper shortages seen all the pictures, right, and all the stories about that. And certainly that it's pretty likely that people have been stocking up because they'll be home for who knows how long. Uh, sometimes you hear the word hoarding. Um, at the same time, I, I saw an interesting story a couple of weeks ago now um, by, by some economists who specialize in research about supply chains. And some of their findings were that at least some of the toilet paper shortage is, is due to um, supply chain issues, where a whole bunch of the supply chain is focused on producing toilet paper for large institutions like schools and, and shopping malls and big businesses and stuff. And when those places aren't being used right now, that there's, a, and that there's different productive capacity that's used for making toilet paper for large institutions versus at home. I've learned a lot of stuff about toilet paper production I never imagined. But in the end, you know, that, 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 there, that there are some other underlying factors for some of these shortages, like in the home consumer market. And it might be easy sometimes to tell a story about like, well, it's other people that are doing stuff that, that gets in my way and I don't trust them. That sometimes there's an underlying um, description that that might be a more accurate telling of what's really going on and it might take time for that to, to surface and so I'd encourage you to be careful about the information that you get and receive and, and and try and be try and be careful like because in the end effect like effectiveness of social distancing and other kinds of measures we might take as communities moving forward rely a lot on transparency and trust and those things really matter that recognize interdependence um, and, and, and the sense of sharing that's happening, that you know, we're all interconnected. Um, our, our local economies are predicated on interdependence. You know, when, when, when folks go and get a haircut, that the money they pay goes to the hairdresser who uses that money to buy food and gas. What happens when no one's leaving home to get haircuts? Then hair, like hairdressers aren't getting paid, right? And restaurants aren't, aren't getting paid. And so that um, we're, we're that, you know, if, if you're able, we'd be, you know, we'd encourage you to, to continue to support those people. Maybe uh, if, if you get a haircut every six weeks, maybe you could consider sending, sending a payment to your hairdresser, uh, you know, every six weeks or, you know, whenever in order to help to, to keep, you know, to keep them, to you know, help them keep themselves fed. You know, that, that we're all interdependent, that there's a lot of interdependence in our communities. Um, that the, 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 I saw a story recently about Amish community members in Ohio who were, who were making face masks for their community. And then they were approached to, to, to expand their operation. And they're, and they're now making masks for the Cleveland Clinic, um, which is one of the largest clinics in the United States. You know, and so that, that, it's, that we all depend on each other in different ways. And be, being, being attuned to that is really important. And then finally, I'd encourage you to, you know, to keep community over individualism that community groups are, are gathering together all over the country in our area uh, in order to work for, to, to improve communities by developing new programs, new policies um, for how, how we should proceed. Um, that there's some level of sacrifice that, that people are undertaking in order to benefit others around us. Um, and this crisis is showing us where cracks in our system really are and we need to do something about it. So getting even more concrete, you know, we know that social distancing works um, by us staying in. We're serving our community, our communities, and our neighbors by not, but by, by, by helping to slow the rate of infection and keeping our high-risk population safe, and helping to make sure that our 
that our hospitals and frontline medical care folks are not being totally swamped. So social distancing works. We need to look local. What are the needs of our neighbors? Are there specific things? You might know of a neighbor down the street that needs something. How can, how can you help them? Um, that there might be particular needs in your community that may not exist in mine. What are those? You're the expert of your experience in your community and that, you know, use what you notice um, to, to help others. Um, if you're able, um, contribute time, money, and expertise um, to, to benefit others. For some people, it's sewing masks. Others, contributing money. Others, you might be able to use some of your professional skills, uh, maybe in a pro bono way or other ways in order, to, in order to serve people in your communities. That all those things are, are valuable. And so being able to, to, to think in those broad ways can be really helpful. Use an existing network um, or build a new one that, that you're, you're connected to, to family and friends locally and very far away. Is there a way of using those connections to, to benefit others in your community? Or are there ways to build a new one? We're using online tools in new ways, and that can help you to identify new opportunities. And then for people who really want to think about next steps in our big picture kind of oriented, what are the next steps that we need to think about beyond our immediate needs? Are there certain kinds of policies or programs or projects? Um, one thing that we seem to be learning through this crisis is that the way that people apply for and receive unemployment benefits may be very inefficient and that's really costing people on the margins. Maybe that's something that needs to be addressed. Are there other kinds of, of programs and projects that we need? And then, as, as you're considering that, who do you need to talk to about that? Are there people that you know that you might want to share ideas worth and figure out how to get together to connect in order to start to move on these kinds of ideas? And so finally, um, getting even, even more concrete, um, here, here, here are some of the specific organizations that, that, that I talked about, that the, the contact information for Lancaster Masks, that they're looking for volunteers to help to sew and deliver fabric masks to people in need in the county, that they're looking for um, financial contributions to support their work. The Lancaster Community Foundation and United Way have created Lancaster Cares, they're down on the, below the Lancaster Masks, that, that they're looking for funding support that they can help get to nonprofit organizations and to people in Lancaster, in Lancaster County in order to provide food and housing um, and, and other kinds of emerging critical needs. Um, and so that they have the lancocares.org website that they encourage people to visit. And that, that their ask is for people to make donations and financial contributions if you can. And knowing that some people may not be in a place to be able to do that right now, that you can also be a fundraiser. Um, where you can share that message through social media to encourage others to contribute who might be able to do that right now. The Central Pennsylvania Food Bank is looking for financial contributions so that they can get food items that, that local food pantries need to disseminate that. Um, that I know that, there are, that there's greatly increasing national demand and local demand um, that, that, that's really stretching food bank resources. Uh, and so that that any kind of support that we can provide them is, is really vital. And then finally, the Foundation for Enhancing Communities is, is um, the, the, the Harrisburg Community Foundation that's, that's working with the United Way of the Capital Region to, to raise funds for their COVID-19 Community Response Fund. And that fund is to help to support the work of nonprofits who are, who are dealing day-to-day -day with people um, in, with different kinds of needs around food and housing in particular in Dauphin County and surrounding counties. And so I'd encourage you to, to search out their information, to, to connect, um, to, to be attuned to other needs as they arise. Um, yeah, and yeah, I'm happy to, to look at a, a couple more questions before I wanna offer some thank yous at the end. Fantastic. Yes. And thank you, Joel. So um, first of all, we did have a, a brief comment that came in. Is it Feed America or Feeding America? That's the national organization? That sounds right to me. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll, I'll have to, when I get offline, I'll be able to check, but that sounds, that, that sounds right. Yes. Okay. So we've got some questions here. Um, one, first of all, how can I be a better advocate for my kids' education? 
at a time like this? That is, that's, that's a really good question. That's an important question. Um, yeah, like that, there, there, there are some different, there are different avenues to do that. Um, you know, one, if you're able, you know, to, to, to being in contact with, with um, children's teachers, like that, that's, I, I know that, that we've received messaging from, from classroom teachers in our district about if you have questions, reach out to us. They spend, they're spending a lot of time doing that. I think that other things to do would be, would be contacting ad administrators. Um, and, but, you know, as th thinking back to one of the civic paths from earlier, you know, that, that the power of organizing about bringing people together, that it could be the case that there may be multiple families in your area that have similar concerns. And if you're able to, to raise some of those concerns together, that, that, that can help to, to, to show that it's, you know, it's not a one-off and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's certainly something that, that's, that's affecting surely a large number of students and families in a particular school or district. Okay. Um, and then perhaps for uh, uh, a very different population, we have this question. My mom's at a retirement home and is getting worried about not seeing her grandkids, and this makes her very sad. How can we cheer her up beyond just a FaceTime chat? Yeah, I, I, I know that, that there have been appeals from different healthcare organizations for people to, to, to send cards and notes and letters to people you know, who, are, who are isolated in, in hospitals and, and, and in retirement communities. That, that's, that's one way. Um, of of doing that um, beyond be, be beyond like the, the kind of FaceTime chat, um, I, I I know that that Lancaster General Hospital. I saw an appeal in in the paper I think the other day that that they're looking for people to to write letters and do those kinds of things. Um, yeah, it's I mean that's that's it's really a, a difficult challenge, frankly, and 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 I think that 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 there might be new project ideas that that come up beyond using, you know, beyond sending mail or doing video chats. And I'm excited to see what people come up with because I'm sure that there are innovative ideas that, that people are probably working on right now. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because one of the things that we haven't really mentioned directly here that I think we should is you're really up against a very high wall here, Joel, in giving this presentation because you're showing us ways to engage and to have more civic engagement at a time when we cannot engage physically. And that's such an immense challenge. It, it really is. Um, so we've got another question here, uh, really kind of two questions that I think are slightly joined. Um, are you aware of any resources that allow students who are interested in volunteering remotely to connect and find each other based on their interests and skills? And then kind of connected to that, um, is it possible, do you think, for colleges to work together to create the kind of uh, unique programming that could serve their students better? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for, like, I'll take on the first part of the question first, um, that, that, you know, like, different colleges are, are putting together different, have putting together different resources, like, to get information out to students, and that, that Elizabethtown College, that, that we have uh, a, 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 an, an app, that, that students use to, that we share information with students. And, and I think a good vehicle is that we can, you know, that we, that to rely on the app to get information out to, to students, you know, ab about what's there. And, and, we, can, and we can provide um, um, kind of like an updated list as, as we post um, ab about, ab about possibilities that exist. And at the same time, students can post on the app about things in their communities that there might be other kinds of virtual community engagement projects that 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 could happen uh, in, does, in does very quickly does does an individual have to be a student or member of the elizabethtown college community to get or use that app to use the app yes but one thing that we one thing that we can do um through our civic engagement website that we can help to disseminate you know is, is to is to pull together you know like we can get this information from this slide out and, and pull some other things that, that things are, are evolving. I've, I've seen different community groups and organizations using Google Docs and other kinds of collaborating resources online to, to share information as things are, are unfolding. Um, that, that really right now, it's like, I'm, I'm not much of a prognosticator, but, but we're kind of in, in, in a transition time where um, that, uh, many non many nonprofits of different kinds have 
have, have, have ceased operations because um, their, their programming isn't, you know, is, isn't providing like immediate care and housing and feeding people, for instance. Like those are the nonprofits who are totally maxed out right now in lots of different ways. Um, I, I think that, that one of the things that as, as we're kind of getting through like this early community impact kind of place with, with the spread of the virus and people are working on housing and feeding, then, then the question comes, you know, like when we're talking about some of the education issues that, that you had raised earlier, Jesse, uh, or, or other kinds of community organization and nonprofit work that, that's kind of been on the, on the back burner at some level right now, that, that I think that, there, that there'll be new needs that, that come up and develop you know, kind of like as, as things stretch into May and potentially even June, who sure. knows in, about providing other kinds of supports. And so I think that, that, that that'll be one of the challenges and opportunities is, is around like identifying like what, what are these, like when, once we get beyond like, not beyond, but like once, once we're dealing more effectively with immediate needs around housing and feeding people, then what, what, what are some additional community supports that, that we need to build into place so that people can get beyond surviving and, and build new patterns to, you know, to, to more fully, you know, to, so people can more fully live in their communities. Okay, well, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you then. Uh, those are the questions that we have. And uh, if you'd like to say a, a few last words, Joel, I'll turn it back over to you and then I'll be back in a few minutes, folks, just to close us out. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. And thanks everyone for your questions that, um, you know, the, I, I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to, to collate responses to questions that have come in that we may not have had a chance to directly address right now. Uh, the, these are all vital questions and yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I wanna extend a, a brief thanks to, to everyone who, who joined and, and participated today. Um, I, I appreciate your, your time and, and thought that you've provided. I wanna say thank you to our, our ITS and technology experts who've made our online broadcasts um, possible. Uh, I wanna want thank Jesse for, her, for coordinating uh, to today's presentation. Um, I, I wanna give a special thank you to my daughter Miriam who gave me very important tech advice on how to animate the community network slide. Uh, and my other daughter Ruth who provided feedback to me. I appreciate that quite a bit. Uh, and then I, I want to encourage you to tune in next week for Under the Microscope Lens, What is Coronavirus? Uh, doc, we'll be joined by Dr. Jody Lancaster and Dr. Deb Wool, uh, who are biologists who can provide an expert view about what the virus is. And thank you, Joel, for this fantastic presentation. A lot of rich, wonderful uh, information. Um, I just want to reinforce all of the thanks that Joel has given and to let everyone know that we really look forward to you joining us again. It's next week on the 22nd at 11. And just to add a little bit of detail to Joel's final comment there, you know, we right now have an administration, a, a, a federal administration, that's thinking of reopening America. And it's so difficult, perhaps, for us to put a real finite fingerprint, so to speak, on what that means for us from a biological perspective. What are the consequences? What are the benefits and gains of reopening? So next week's presentation is going to be so necessary and just stellar because we'll be hearing from two fantastic biologists and scientists who will help us understand what this virus is. And of course, that can empower us to really then understand what information is coming from our government in terms of assessing that ever-present question when will things get back to normal? Folks, thank you so much for joining us here at the COVID-19 Lecture Series from Elizabethtown College. I'm Jesse Waters, Director of the Bowers Writers House here, and we hope to see you next week.